So the team in National Beef made this happen, and actually they were harvested. These, these carcasses were harvested on the early bird sale of January 25th. So Brian and Teresa and all their team made this happen. We're going to give you steer number 836, and they'll tell you the details. I'll tell you some more, but he's a prime meal grade two. Uh, he's sired by the Momentum Sun Breakthrough, and he's out of a cow that was sired by a, a bull called Unassisted. He was designed to be what he is. He's a prime meal grade two. And I think many of you have been to Certified Angus Beef in Worcester, Ohio. I know I was fortunate to get to go there. But you talk about the passion for our business. You talk about the energy. You talk about the culture to sell and to create and to educate about the greatest tasting protein in the world. That culture is there. But all that being said, I give you Dr. Diana and Dr. Daniel Clark. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Just real quick, so Diana, Daniel, we worked at Certified Angus Beef. I've uh, been there for about seven years. How many years have you been there? Three. So I'm meat scientist number one, just so everyone knows that. He's meat scientist number two, okay? Just to clarify really quick. Um, but, so we're both from Illinois. We transplanted over to Ohio. Um, where in Illinois are you from? I'm from southern Illinois in a little bitty town called Auburn, Illinois. And I'm from a town that probably no one has ever heard of. It's actually... Uh, the suburbs of Chicago, everyone. Anyone heard of Chicago before, out of curiosity? <laughs> okay. So yeah, I stumbled into agriculture along the way, and um, I love it. Honestly, this is, to me, this is kind of like a dream come true to be able to come here and, and talk to producers about this, because this is something that I'm extremely passionate about, and I know Daniel is too. Before I, we jump into some content, really quick, I wanted just to share with you. So that's Paul Dykstra. He's on our supply development team. If you guys want to get regular market updates, you can just snap a picture of that QR code right there, just to continue to get some insights from Certified Angus Beef. And then I also want to point out some scholarships that we have available um, and internships opportunities. All right, so now the big question, why do people eat beef? Why do consumers eat beef? It tastes good. It tastes good. Yeah, that's right. It tastes really good. I mean, that beef was excellent that we had tonight. And so now I have to ask, considering where we're sitting and the audience that we have in front of, why do people eat prime beef? Because it tastes really good, okay? And the consumers are getting to know that more and more. Uh, before we used to have, when I was in, in college, honestly only about 3% of cattle would make it into that USDA prime grade. Now we're seeing a tremendous amount of more cattle making into that program. And it's awesome because it's not only producer driven, it's also demand driven. And so we see that we are able to produce more prime, we're able to sell more prime, and we're able to sell it at higher prices, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. Usually you have a big supply of something, you know, the prices start to go down, but we have a huge demand and we have this huge supply and it just continues to drive, meaning that demand is becoming higher and higher. And at Certified Angus Beef, I get to do some consumer research as well on top of the meat science uh, things. And so one thing that I started to notice is that consumers have more options when it comes to flavor, okay? We walked down, we were at Brahms today, we walked down the ice cream aisle. Have anyone done that here recently? Seen how many options you have for ice cream? It's not just chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry anymore. I mean, there's chocolate peanut butter, there's unicorn flavor, there's everything under the sun, okay? Because people are looking for those different flavors. You see it in coffee, too. Well, why isn't it in beef? And it is. And that's where this demand for prime is coming. It's because consumers want that taste. They've had it, and now they want more of it. You can see that the two, choice and prime, continue to go up. Since 2010, they continue to rise, whereas select continues to go down in terms of production, how we're actually producing beef. Now, if we flip to the next slide, that was, that was industry right. Now, let's take a quick, kind of a, a, a quick look at certified Angus beef brand prime extension. And Diana's going to talk a little bit later about what exactly it takes to get into the certified Angus beef prime brand extension. Um, but I'm going to really brief kind of talk about where it is, where is production. And you can see it mimics what we see with the, the industry-wide prime. Um, production continues to increase. If we go back to 2010, we see more and more cattle that are being certified into the Certified Angus Beef Prime Brand Extension. If you go to the next slide, 
Now, that's production. But what does it look like from a, from a, selling, a selling standpoint, demand standpoint? And right here you can see that it also continues to increase. Exactly what Diana was saying. Consumers are demanding more prime. And actually, one of the things that if you look there on the, the bar graph, you can see kind of the, the percent change. And the only time we saw a reduction there was in 2020. And what obviously happened in 2020? Right? Okay, what did COVID do to the restaurant industry? It shut it down. They were a big user of certified Angus beef brand prime. They love certified Angus beef brand prime. And that's why we see about negative, um, that negative reduction or a reduction there in, in, in demand. Now, I will point out, though, that right there actually changed our whole dynamics. And I think it's going to change it pretty significantly moving forward as well. Because while restaurants shut down, they no longer were able to use the certified Angus beef prime. Now, on the other side, we have all these grocery stores, and they're, trying, they're selling meat like crazy, and they actually are now introduced to certified Angus Beef brand prime, and they're, they're customers, they're ones, they can't go to the restaurant, so now they go to the grocery store looking for stuff that's such high quality, and they're turned on to certified Angus Beef brand prime at the grocery store. Well, now, fast forward, and now we have the consumer recognizing they can get it now at a grocery store, and we have the restaurants back in service who now want that brand, that prime brand extension as well, so now we have kind of this all-time high demand for Prime. Everyone wants it now. It doesn't matter if it's a grocery store. It doesn't matter if it's a restaurant. They all want brand Prime. So that's where we see some really unique things that are happening after the pandemic when it comes to demand. Now, the next slide shows how Prime has been affected um, in terms of selling, in terms of price. And what we find here, and this is not the certified Angus Beef brand Prime. This is just commodity Prime. Um, but you can, again, see that Prime prices... Um, have continued to increase. Since 2000, I believe it's 2010 I have on there, we see that prime prices are trending upward. Now what's amazing to me, and Diana alluded to this earlier, is if you put this graph on um, our, our, um, the, the production side, so if you click to the next slide, um, with both of them, as she said earlier, we are producing more prime as an industry than we ever have before, and it continues to go up. And we're also seeing that prime prices are continuing to go up. Now how many things that you know of do you do you put more of it out there and at the same time get higher prices for it? Okay, that just shows right there that demand is so healthy when it comes to the, the prime marketplace. Okay, that, that right there is a great illustration of that. So now we want to look at just what, what it takes to make it into certified Angus beef. And these are, these are up there, our 10 specifications. And you guys can, can look through those. If you're interested in ever driving up to Worcester, Ohio, it's a great, fabulous town that you guys should all make it as a destination stop. Just don't all come at once because we probably don't have room for everyone. But if you guys want to come little by little, we really recommend that you come visit the Culinary Center. So the first one that I really want to point out is that modest amount of marbling or higher. So that's what it takes to make it into certified Angus beef. And you can see that marbling card on the side there. So that is that average choice. Okay, that's really important because majority of A stamp cattle, so those cattle that are predominantly black hided, will not make it into the brand because they simply do not have enough marbling. Okay, we're, we're at an acceptance rate at about 35% right now. So out of all black hided cattle that are uh, harvested, about 35% of them can make it into the brand falling in other specifications. Now, looking at certified Angus beef prime, they need to have a slightly abundant marbling. And you can see how that, that does increase pretty drastically um, in that card there on the left. So just to, to point out a little bit, a lot of people will ask, okay, so out of those 10 specifications, what really kicks them out of the brand? And as I said before, that marbling is key. So we have from 2008 up to 2019 shown. We do have that 2020 data, but we want to kind of hang you on the edge of your seat before we show that to see the differences that happened during uh, COVID. But as we got kept in continuing on, as genetics continued to improve and become more of an importance from the producer standpoint, we see that decrease in overall marbling score. Still, still the highest percentage of what's kicking the cattle out of the brand, but definitely we've had significant improvements over time, which is pretty phenomenal. Then we move down to hot carcass weight, ribeye area, and back fat thickness. And those are the other three uh, that really play into that message as well. And so that's where things become really interesting because marbling, and you think about hot carcass weight, back fat thickness, some of those all go hand in hand, wouldn't you think? Okay, so we start to see that out there and we're gonna dive into that a little bit more here. 
When it comes to certified against beef prime, or, and it really just prime in general, I should say, I think there's really two main things to think about that really drive the equation of how can we, how can we possibly produce more prime. And really it boils down to genetics and management. Okay, that's, I would say that's the two biggest pieces, right? Genetics being what, what we're choosing to, to sire the cattle in. Management, there's lots of things that go into management. But in reality, I would say, and what research has showed, is genetics makes up about 40% of the equation, whereas management's going to make up the rest. And again, management, it seems seems like management's the bigger piece of that pie, but in reality, there's so many more things in management that we can also impact. If you think about days on feed, nutrition, implanting strategies, all those add up to about 60%, but there's a large, junk, a large chunk of the pie right there eaten up by genetics. And in fact, really one of the cool things that we actually got to look at during the pandemic, Diana said that she skipped that 2020 numbers because we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Because some, of the, some really cool things happened during the pandemic. And actually Clint Wallencheck, our director of packing, we, me and him kind of dove into some of the data to really understand what exactly was happening during the pandemic and, and acceptance rate and hot carcass weight. And we found, if you take a look at that red line, um, that's, that red line represents hot carcass weights. Okay, hot carcass weights across the beef industry. You can see hot carcass weights. We all know they've been increasing, but look what happened from 2019 to 2020. Huge increase in hot carcass weight. Acceptance rate is, the, is gonna be the gray graph, or the gray bars, okay? We see that that continues to increase. Now, let's take a look at 2020 specifically and um, see what happened with the pandemic. So, if we look at this, and I think we're all pretty well in tune with this, but during the pandemic, right, we had a bunch of plants that shut down, and, it, and consequently, we had a bunch of cattle that were on, backlogged in the feed yards, right, and then consequently, the, the cattle that were in the feed yards had increased days on feed, and then they had to change some management strategies, kind of a, a little bit of both, right, when you think about how they're feeding them, um, implant strategies, and so forth, but together, those things did really two things, when, and in our terms, right? They looked at, they increased hot carcass weights by about 25 pounds, and we increased accept, certified Angus beef acceptance rate by about 1.2%. Now what's interesting is that 1.2% increase in certified Angus beef acceptance rate was not significantly different than, um, than really years, pr years prior. Okay, if we look at that, that 1.2% is pretty much what we've seen increasing with our acceptance rate. I mean, clear back since like 2012, that seems to be the, uh, the exact same. What's fascinating is if we take a look at this 2020 graph, and I think this graph right here, this table, tells us a couple things. First off, when we increase hot carcass weight by, by increasing days on feed, that does a couple things. One, it allows cattle to put down more marbling, which is great. And I think putting more pounds on some of our animals in the beef industry is exactly what we need to be doing to really taking advantage of the genetic potential that those cattle have. Okay, and we can see that's, that is exactly what happened right here. We have increased marbling um, such that now if we look at the cattle that are missing the mark, we're dropped it by 10%, still a very large percentage of cattle that are not making our brand because they did not have enough marbling, but we made some vast improvements, a 10% reduction in the cattle that aren't making the brand because they had marbling. But take a look at the next three, the next three, hot carcass, weight, ribeye, and back fat. Those increased. Okay, which, which would be expected. Okay, so again, when we increase hot carcass weight, increase days on feed, we are increasing marbling. Okay, that's great. But it, this right here also goes to show that probably management strategies are not the, necessarily the, the, the give all, the only thing that we can do to really impact our certified Angus beef acceptance rates. Perhaps genetics at the same time as making some management changes could make even a bigger impact on our marbling without such significant changes in our hot carcass weight, ribeye area, and fat. Okay, so it's kind of a combination of the two. So we happen to have some data, and this is from the American Angus Association, just looking at overall traits and their heritability. So if you look at, down on the column on the left, and you follow all the way down to that marbling score, you look at that 0.48 heritability. And if you start looking at all the other heritabilities of those traits up there, you'll notice it's actually number three in terms of heritable traits, okay? Now that is really cool. So I, I'm thinking about this as someone that's went through animal science at University of Illinois. I'm like, dang, that's awesome that I could select for that marbling. But, you know, I've seen some places where you start selecting heavy on marbling or heavy on one trait. I know I was taught that in livestock judging. You start selecting on one, you got to worry about what else is happening in the background. Okay? That's the cool part about selecting for that quality, selecting for marbling, because it is the third most highly heritable trait out of those listed. 
and it doesn't significantly impact any maternal or growth genetics as well. That's awesome. That means you continue selecting for quality, selecting for that marbling, but not impacting your herd production at the same time. This is uh, what, what Mark kind of already alluded to. So on the left, Diane is actually going to be working with um, the certified, or the certified against beef prime, the GRA breakthrough sired carcass right there. Basically, she said she's meat scientist number one. She gets to work with the prime. Um, hers has a ribeye area of 15.88. Remember, our ribeye area specification is between 10 and 16 square inches. Hers makes it. Mine does not. Um, it is uh, 16.92 square inches back fat. And you can see, if you look at that over there, it has a half an inch of back fat. Mine has significantly more. I, the sort loin is like encased in fat over here. It's, it's quite crazy. Um, and then hers has slightly abundant 37, which is going to be low prime. Mine is, has small, what is it, small 37, which is going to be low choice. Okay, so that's the differences here. And what we're ultimately going to do is we're actually going to break every piece that comes out of here. We have a scale. We're going to weigh it. And then we have um, a couple of volunteers. I think they were kind of volunteered, voluntold by Mark. So if you guys want to come up... Um, they're gonna help us do some calculations as we go. Okay, let's go ahead and we're gonna start by breaking down our strip loin. All right. And uh, just to let you guys know, if you have any questions during any of this, please feel free to ask. Uh, that is what we are here for. And we're hoping to get these all down to subprimals. And if we uh, have time afterwards, you guys want to see things broken down a little bit further, please feel free to come up here and we can break these down to, to steaks. Uh, just if you want to know how, it's always something fun that we do at, at the Culinary Center for sure. So the first thing we're doing and the first thing I'm doing, I don't know if he's doing the same thing. Sometimes we do things differently. It usually leads to some arguments at times, but hopefully today we'll keep that personal. Um, but I am removing this kidney fat. So this is greatly going to impact our overall yields. Um, I noticed that he has quite a bit of that on there. Mine is, is not as much, and that's again because it's that lower yield grade. So you'll notice kind of the piles of, of fat that we get built up over time. So this is mine. I'm gonna show him that kidney fat over there. I have to, I have to let you guys know, because if you were at the culinary center, we would definitely talk about this a little bit. Um, have any of you guys ever cooked a kidney before? Anyone? Okay, does, that, does anyone want to share? Do you know, know how to cook a kidney? You boil the piss out of it. Okay, so just... Are you going for the tenderloin first? I, I am. I'm going to get the tenderloin out, and then we'll get the strip loin after that. See, I'm going to follow protocol and... Uh, Go for the, the strip loin here, but we'll see. Actually, this is where we get our porterhouses and T-bones for. You have to, this is like one of those parts of the, the fabrication process where we need to make a decision. Um, and, the, and the packer is going to do the exact same thing. He's got to decide, if, does he have more demand for T-bones and porterhouses, or is it uh, strip loin and tenderloin that day? Um, but you can't do both on a carcass. You've got to pick one or the other. And that's something neat that we do at the Culinary Center. Um, we have people come in regularly. Uh, it's during COVID, it, it definitely slowed down, but we are up and running again. We usually have two to three groups coming in a week. Um, and they're, they're anything from food distributors uh, to uh, restaurant owners, restaurant chefs. Um, we get some college groups in there as well. We actually even get some uh, different, different groups in, in terms of American Angus Association. So uh, the Kentucky Angus Association is actually coming in next week on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, so we, we get to, to break things down and kind of show them where different cuts come from. But all of those chefs and food distributors and retailers that we work with, a lot of them work with beef every day, but they really don't know much about the production side um, or even knowing where those cuts come from. So we have a, usually a whole side of beef that we can break down in front of them and just show them where those cuts are and help create some light bulb moments. And our goals with that is to, to get them more confident in selling so they can then sell more beef because you've got the confidence that makes it a lot easier. And then also just making them more aware of different parts on the animal so that they can utilize it and we drive more value back to that, that carcass itself. So I am gonna go ahead and weigh, I pulled the tenderloin off first. So this is the Certified Angus Beef Prime Tenderloin. We can get that weight. 
Can we Mine is four and a half pounds. So that's always something to consider how, uh, I'm sure you guys know that, but how small of a beast that is with a, a high dollar price. That is definitely uh, my, my mother's favorite cut and it drives me absolutely bonkers when she asks for me to order some. Because uh, usually i trying to win the favorite child. I'm still not there, but I feel like if I pay for enough tenderloins, eventually I'll get there. Uh, man, that is just a little a bit of a dent in the pocket. So one thing that's kind of fun, though, is that I was able to uh, play a little, have, I, I don't want to say play a trick, but do a science project with my, my mom. So Again, how she likes those tenderloins so much. Well, we, we can do some creative things with these other cuts like the strip loin and the sirloin to make them look like a filet, but they're not a filet. And in my defense, I feel like I'm also trying to help her because, you know, the, the filet does not have as much marbling as you would have some other cuts. So one of the cuts that I decided to do was a rib filet. And... Uh, for some of you guys that might know this, some of you might not, but the rib filet has this great cut on there called the spinalis, which is the ribeye cap. Might be the most favorited cut by majority of meat scientists. Um, so I was able to cut some of those rib filets for her. I packaged them up. Uh, and then I also did some tenderloins as well. I did not mention that there was that one cut called the spinalis, and I may have kept that for our freezer. Uh, but I did, I did put the rib fillets in packages of, of two. I had strip fillets in packages of three, and the tenderloin in packages of one. So I give them to her, because I'm trying to prove a point here that you don't need to order tenderloin every single time, Mom. But she always insists. So I give them to her, and she, she'll say that she cooked them one night as she's calling me and telling me this. I so, all right, Mom, how many were in the package? And she goes, oh, there was two. I'm like, that's the rib filet. So I didn't say that, though, of course not. I'm like, so how did it taste? She's like, oh, that had so much flavor. It was be the best tenderloin I ever had. I'm like, that's because it wasn't a tenderloin, Mom. But maybe one day I will tell her I just need all the data in front of me to prove it. It's going to happen sometime soon. I got the tender one out, it weighed four pounds, so what we were at four and a half for years, mine was four pounds. All right. I think they're doing the math. What is that, the value of those tenderloins over there? Let's take a look at that. So their value of that tenderloin for low choice was 47.6 versus certified Angus beef prime was 81.9. So it's a little bit of a difference. So now we're going to go back to those strip loins here. So again, since like Daniel said before, we created the tenderloin, so now we're not going to have your T-bones and porterhouses. But that's something fun to talk about with retailers because as you have some of those seasonal cuts come out, so like as retail uses more strips, uh, more tenderloins in, uh, in the winter time, sometimes you could get better values on different cuts. So like those, the butt tenders, which was left here on the sirloin itself, is going to become more valuable to uh, that, that, re that restaurant per person than it would uh, during other times of the year. So again, how we try to focus on that carcass utilization is, is key. So I'm just about to get this strip loin off, but I do need to break off one piece on here before I do that. Have any of you actually heard of the sirloin flap? Show of hands. Okay, just a few. Now, a lot of uh, the a, a smaller processor, if you guys are getting some of your, I'm guessing most of you are getting your own beef uh, brought in, that is going to a lot of times be put as a skirt steak, as we've seen in past. Um, but you need to make sure that you pull it out and cook it because that is a piece that is just phenomenal. That usually blows everyone's mind. Um, and it, it is the same thickness of a skirt, er, skirt steak, same muscle direction, um, but it just has a lot more marbling. It's very similar to that tri-tip that we had tonight in terms of marbling level. Uh, fun fact on the, the sirloin flat is actually the sirloin flat has kind of also, it used to be a very economical cut, and people wanted something 
that at the outside skirt actually with the, the that was the go-to cut. It's also phenomenal. Outside skirt is really, really good. Highly marbled. And actually now it sometimes rivals the tenderloin, tenderloin on a price per pound. Just last year it started to increase past the tenderloin. So tenderloin always is the most expensive cut on the carcass. Today it goes back and forth between the tenderloin and the outside skirt. So people are looking for alternatives for the outside skirt. But what they find? The sirloin flat. That would be a great alternative until everyone else found out about it and now the price that is also gone out. So now people are looking for alternatives for the sirloin flat. Um, but that's a great, a great, great cut. Now this is just a small piece of it. It's kind of been cut in half a little bit, but that is completely okay. We're still going to take weight of it because again, just the, the value on this alone. Um, but I do also want to point out just a, a little bit of a fun fact to throw Daniel uh, under the bus a little bit on this. Um, but so if you guys realize, I worked at Certified Angus Beef for seven years. He's, he's getting close to three. Well, during those first four years before he joined the team, I would bring home these random cuts for him and tell him to try it. And he every time would, oh, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Then all of a sudden he joined Certified Angus Beef, and this is the greatest cut ever. I'm like, I've been bringing this home for you for seven years, and you still, uh, it's just, it takes a chef to cook it. Apparently I didn't cook it great enough for him. So this was one pound, just that little one. I did cut my strip loin down to uh, zero by one. Yep. Yeah, so if you guys look at this, so if this animal was, was being graded, I left a bone on there, that's pretty bad. Um, if this animal was being graded, it would be hanging like this, okay? So my, my tail of the animal's going up this way, the head's going down this way. They actually rib the animal right here between the 12th and 13th rib. They evaluate that ribeye area uh, to see. And so this, this strip loin is actually a very good picture of that ribeye. And we, we had that up there on, on screen. It's basically a mirror image right there. Um, but if you look at the length of tail that's on here, so they have that zero by one. Zero is the distance off of that longissimus dorsi muscle, so you come right to the edge of there, and the one would be off of this end here. Okay? These are all referring back to the meat buyer's guide. Uh, it's not a rule book, it's just a guidebook, but so that way if I am buying from a, a packing plant that is in... Um, Chicago or one that's in Texas, I'm going to get roughly the same cut. If I order a zero by one, they'd call it a 180 strip loin. It's going to be roughly the same. There's going to be a little things that are slightly different, maybe in terms of how they trim that back fat down or something of the sort. But that way I can have some consistency in product, rather who I'm buying it from. So then I can compare prices across category and try to buy with the one that seems most, most fair at that point. Okay, but there's definitely restaurants and retailers that like to work with specific uh, packing plants is because they have great relationships. Just so, like I'm sure you guys like to work with specific people as well. So I'm going to uh, weigh the strip loin. As it, let me get it back to zero there. 16.5 pounds. Okay, I'm going to point out that while she probably is faster than me, I'm also doing way more trimming. <laughs> it should go a little bit longer to get this guy done. <coughs> yeah. So. so I'll just slow down a little bit over here. Uh, it's time for my coffee break. Yes, we are going to weigh the trim at the end just, just to show, but it's not really in the calculation. You'll see some of those differences in the calculation, but that's definitely a huge factor. And so you really have to think about that too. As someone is cutting these, breaking these down, that's significantly going to impact their overall production. Rather, if it's done at the packing plant or if it's done at a restaurant or it's done at retail, someone's going to have to trim that down because no one wants all of that fat. Not only that, but also, I mean, when we, when we actually do the cutting tests, one thing that we can obviously do from a research standpoint is we'll do yield. That makes sense. Some people also forget about literally time. Uh, we'll do, we'll, people will be, um, just, they'll cut down loins and they'll time and take them how long it is. You can imagine how much longer it would take someone on a line to try to cut this thing. I mean, I'm still whittling away, and I don't know if I'm even close yet. Uh, so there's, there's that part of the, even the, the product as well. I just gave him the low, the higher yield grade, so he wouldn't feel as bad if I if I beat him. So he has a, a little bit of an excuse there. It's all right. Um, 
But that really is, is something to think about. And we talk about that with a lot of restaurants as well, because a lot of them will order commodity trim in, which means that it just wasn't trimmed up before uh, they purchased it, thinking that they're getting a, a better deal. But really the truth is, is that they're paying for a lot of fat. Um, and that's, that's really what comes down to some animal management and practices as well, is that, yeah, it seems like you're, you're doing better, but really you're just paying for more fat on the animal. And sometimes that's not going to work out, as we saw here. I mean, you, you can add more feed, but that doesn't always guarantee that you're going to get that high quality animal that you're looking for. And that's something that we talk about a lot um, at Certified Angus Beef, really focusing in on genetics, regardless of who's in there. Um, and the easiest way for us to walk through some of that is to talk about Michael Phelps. Because that man, I don't know if you realize this, but he is designed to swim. I mean, he's got these long, huge arms, short little legs, like he is designed to be a swimmer. However, if he didn't train every day and eat, I think he eats like 10,000 calories a day, he would never be able to make it to where he is. So it definitely takes a little bit of both, but there's no way if I tried to be as good of a swimmer as him, I'm not gonna make it. I don't have the same genetic potential. And if I trained as hard as he would, I would never make it to that mark. And so that's really an easy way to, to communicate that in order to have that light bulb moment go on. This one weighed 15.5. Okay. So now are we going into uh, the top sirloin? Yep. Boning that out? Okay. Yep. Do you want me to pause for a second? <laughs> no? Okay. Just, all right, just check. But this, this top sirloin is one for us that is, it's a lot of fun because uh, we always call this kind of the gateway drug into prime. Um, and I say that because the price point typically between certified Angus beef and certified Angus beef prime is minimal. Um, I think a lot of people just don't understand the true value of the top sirloin specifically. So we usually try to get them to fall into prime, uh, trying this top sirloin cut, and then once they do, they realize how good it is, and then they think, well, for just a little bit more, I could pay for a certified Angus beef prime strip loin, and it kind of just gets them hooked. Once they've had this, it's just that, that conversation piece to continue opening up the door to more prime. So that's something we've really been pushing a lot lately. And as Daniel was talking about retail, it is incredible to see the amount of retailers that are really taking advantage of the certified ASB prime when it comes to your end meats. And I think that is truly necessary to drive home the value of those cuts. Uh, you really don't see a lot of restaurants working with them, but you, again, kind of like this, the sirloin, the cost of it is, is totally worth it to pay just a few cents more in order to get that prime quality in the end meats. And you'll guys see this, if, if you do want to come up at the end and we can break down these into steaks, you can truly see the difference in marbling here. And I haven't even cut this into steaks, but I can already see it just in this, this back end. So there's that. You got that done yet? No? Okay. Just looking, top sirloin, I'm gonna bone. There's a little bit of a hip bone right there. It's kind of funny, because I'll joke, but to be completely honest, Daniel cut, taught me how to cut beef. He just worked in the uh, poultry world for a little bit. I know that's pretty foul, okay? <laughs> but I got a little bit of a, a head start on that. All right, so let me zero that out. This is uh, 16 pounds. That top sirloin has the, the center cut, and then it also has your uh, culotte or picanha. Does everyone know, know that cut, top sirloin cap? That's your, the true cut from those Brazilian steakhouses that you see on skewers. Uh, that cut's phenomenal, definitely a, a great cut. And then finally here, I will pull these out, but I'll kind of, I'll wait a little bit. So here's our, our ball tip. Hey, this cut is actually gaining a lot of popularity here uh, recently. It's marketable as a sirloin. It's from the bottom sirloin. You could really seam this out, but what we've seen since those outside skirt steaks and sirloin flat prices have gone up, 
people are trying to look for alternatives. Where else can I find some of those thin meats? And so a lot of, of our distributors are actually taking this and they slice it super thin on their slicer and they use that more for your fajita style meats. It's got a little bit of that silver skin right in there so it adds to a little bit of that chewiness that you, you usually want to have in that skirt steak. Um, and this, so this has been a great alternative lately. And then also uh, Chef Peter at the Culinary Center if you guys are looking for an item to smoke almost like a pulled, pulled pork, you could take, because no one really wants to eat pork, right? Everyone wants to eat beef. So you could take this, you rub it down in mustard, salt and pepper, and you put it in the smoker. Usually we just leave it in there for about four hours, let it get to 160 degrees. It might even be less than that. Um, then you could you put it in your oven. It's wrapped in uh, aluminum foil, saran wrap to kind of hold that moisture in and let it sit overnight at about 180 degrees. This thing will shred apart like beautiful. Or if you don't want to put it in the oven, you could pop it in the crock pot after that. And so then you honestly, it just continues to cook in all of its juices. It is phenomenal and probably one of the easiest things to reheat. This is a, a go-to at our house for sure. Yeah, I didn't have to do any trimming because I'm working with certifying as beef prime. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but as we continue to work this out, see, this is this it's it's comical, but it's so so true. And we are very blessed to we really only work with with certified Angus beef cattle at the culinary center. So finally, I'm getting down on on this side after the the ball tip is that tri tip. That's the cut that you had tonight. How, how many of you guys enjoyed that? Yeah, that is pretty phenomenal. And this is a great cut, great cut to use um, that you know you're gonna hold it for a while because it has so much marbling in it uh, and it's, it just really does fantastic. Just making sure that you, you slice it against the grain. But this is uh, definitely the cut, the barbecue cut of California. This is what they kind of use instead of the brisket, uh, which if anyone's from Texas, I'm sorry that I that I even compared that to brisket, but it is it is a fantastic cut to utilize, and just remembering that the the size of it's not as as tremendous either, so you can really do it in a fast manner, but still have a grating experience. Now you can leave the fat cap on, and sometimes it is sold with that fat cap on. I looked like ours tonight had a little bit of a fat cap on there, um, but you could also majority of them are sold with that fat cap removed. And they put this uh, Santa Maria rub on them typically, which is uh, salt, pepper, garlic powder, and then a little bit of uh, granulated honey. If you don't have that, you could just utilize um, some brown sugar. But that granulated honey just gives a, a good bite to it. But that is a, uh, a simple rub, put it on there, cook it to about 130 degrees, and uh, this thing comes out fantastic. If you guys need that, that recipe, you can. Uh, message me or something or uh, we also have it on our website too. Okay, I'm just going to finish getting this this fat off here and so now that's your top sirloin. You left the bone in there. Let's not try to add to that weight a little bit. Come on. All right. So this is at 12 pounds. It's a big difference. Oh, yeah, okay. Yep. And we're going to go to the ball tip next. We actually have a, uh, so this ball tip is one and a half pounds. And I will get, I'll put that there. Get the weight on this one. This one's at four and a half pounds. So his ball tip's at three pounds. Um, if you ever go to a, a packing plant, it's, it's kind of neat because it, it, actually they say Henry Ford got the idea of how to assemble a car. So they, they, they'll literally bring in a carcass and honestly within 20 minutes the entire thing will be taken apart, put into a bag, vacuum packaged and ready to go in a box. It is unbelievable. But they'll have a bunch of people just standing in line. 
And so that carcass will start. The first guy will make one cut going down. The next one will make one cut. And they'll try to say, like, that first guy will take carcasses one and three or one and four. And the next one will take two. And so it's, it's kind of spread out. But they just make these little knife cuts. And then over time, they'll just they'll fall out. They'll catch them. They'll throw them on a line. And that line goes. And then the people underneath them are bagging them and putting them in boxes. So they're literally making these little cuts every single time. Um, and before that animal even gets in there, they'll usually blast it full of air. Um, and so it's to open it up, open up those seams a little bit. So when your knife hits it, it runs down a lot easier. Uh, but having a sharp knife is key. And so we have actually saw, especially during COVID, there was a lot of slow in production, um, and primarily because you didn't have as many people working. The marbling scoring today at most, most of the larger packers will use what's called a camera, um, and they will take a picture, of the, a picture of the ribeye surface, and that'll give them, within a, a flip of a switch, that'll give them the, the, the size of the ribeye, it'll give them a marbling score, and then also they'll have the hot carcass weight on the screen, so the USDA grader no longer has to be quite as as involved now it's not all of them are doing that but they can look at the screen and they can now they still have the power if they don't don't believe that is prime is two and a half wrong, the traditional is two so that is we got it yes we did what do we got um so they're going to do some math for us now so it looks like when we add that all up we just wrote down 37 pounds of usable product for our low choice um, loin. Now again, keep in mind as we're, as we're thinking about this, these guys have the, the same hot carcass weight. I mean, they're within a pound of each other. So virtually the same hot carcass weight. And we're looking at one of the loins, like I said earlier, you can basically multiply this by two because they're basically symmetrical, right? What we see on this side, we're probably gonna see on the other one. Um, so that right there is 37 pounds, and we add up the value of all those cuts, and we'll leave that up there for you guys to dissect and digest uh, um, later on, but that adds up to $238.60 for the value of this particular loin. I will also point out, and you probably all are aware of this, but the loin happens to be the most valuable primal on the carcass, right? The, the strip loin, the tenderloin, that drives the value of this significantly higher. You'll see more within the past five, ten years because of the, the focus that we've put on the chuck of fabricating out, getting, you guys have heard of the Terrace Major, flat irons, trying to, to isolate some of those muscles, the Denver steak coming out of your short ribs. Those are things that we had never done before. Um, we just kind of had your seven bone roast and your arm bone roast and call it good. And, but now we're trying to break those down a little bit further. And those are finding so much value in food service uh, that's really driving the demand over into those chuck cuts. So again, just adding more value into the overall animal. Now, so when we, when we break this down, again, they just showed that, again, this weighed 37 pounds of usable product that gave us a value of $238.60. Over here, we had a, a weight of 45 pounds, and when we take the value of all that, certified use prime comes out to $359.23. Right there shows what consumers are demanding. Okay, that, that is really the bottom line of this. That price reflects exactly what the demand is by our consumers. Um, now, the other flip side of this is that's more on, I would say, a quality grade level. Uh, the yield percent there at the bottom now, this kind of goes back to what they're paying, right? The, this, they weigh the same hot carcass weights. They're paying, weighing on a hot carcass weight basis. But this one had a yield of 43.3%. This one had a yield of 53.6%. So not only when we break it down to that more valuable actual product, but it's also more usable product, okay? And it just really goes to show what the power of genetics does. Again, this is what I said earlier. We only broke down one primal. We only broke down the loin. Extrapolate that in your mind to what it does to those other primals. Okay? We also know, and this is thanks to Brian. Um, he, he did the, the, the math here. When, and I forgot to change that. This, it says January spread, but that is actually incorrect. That is actually, if we were to market these cattle, and, and I won't point out, I'm going to briefly go this because Mark's going to talk more about it. But if we were to market these cattle today, um, or just actually two weeks ago, um, that is the, uh, the value difference between that certifying it be prime and the USDA choice. It was a $238 spread between those, um, on a per head basis, between those animals if they were marketed on the same grid. 
Now, I will also point out, like I said, ignore that January spread. I, that's a typo. That would be two weeks ago. The next slide actually breaks this down. On, that's supposed to be the, to the real true January spread. As um, they alluded to earlier, we actually, or they actually um, sent these to harvest in January. And at that time, that was the actual true value difference. And as you can imagine, just like cattle prices go up and down, meat prices do too. And that's why we obviously see the difference. So we wanted to put this back to what it was on today's market where we actually have the market price for the meat as well. So, but that's what it would have been in January. So Mark, I think, I think that pretty well sums up what we got. Henry Gardner really loved Will Rogers and he always used all these quotes. And when we think about this display and this discussion tonight, it reminds me a lot of how people learn. And as we go through this and we think about it, uh, Will said there's three kinds of men, as in mankind. One time at our favorite university of the Kansans here, you know, it, was, it means mankind, Ema, mankind. But when we're talking about mankind, those three kinds of people, some of them learn by reading. You know, there's a whole bunch of uh, you in this room that learn by observation. But, um, you know, I often talk about Mark Smart Gardner and going into coal packing plants and I would like to point out Teresa Martin again. I remember Gail Seibert used to help Dad and us go in there, and, and she's a protege of that. This, this young lady has probably gathered more carcass data, as much of carcass data as anybody I know on earth, and we owe a great debt of gratitude to you, Teresa. But I didn't like packing plants. I was carrying the clipboard, and I went in there, and I go, Henry, why are we doing this? It's cold in here, and they don't really want us here. We're disrupting them, and we're slowing them up. And... You know, those guys look really big and tough, and I'm just a little guy. He said, we need to know what our end product is. But, you know, I'll get into some more things, but this is how I learn. And so that's the way the rest of us have to learn by experiencing this and living it. What a great learning opportunity, not only for all of us here uh, tonight, but for consumers about what a wonderful product we have. So when we think about it, we think about all that data and such. And so, you know, Dad loved to keep records and uh, I don't know if James Branham's here yet tonight or not, but he was talking about Henry's top ten for these different traits, and I failed to get that put into to this catalog, but uh, Henry always liked to keep track of things. And he started getting carcass data in 1970, so I'll fess up, I was nine years of age then, and since that time, um, we've never missed a year yet. So uh, we've gathered 14,127 carcasses. Uh, in the old days, before instrument grading, uh, we went in there with the clipboards, and I don't know if Teresa did. We used to grab those tags, we put them in a baggie and stick them in. I'm going, they probably won't let us do that now. But uh, and you look at the American Ag Association database, on one hand, we're, we're pleased to contribute. And I know we have a lot of Angus colleagues in here tonight. You too can submit data, okay? You too can help. So let's, let's get more data to where we can make better decisions. But of the 112 sires, of the 663 sires with at least one carcass in the American Angus Association database, uh, we've collected data on 112 of those, which adds up to those 14,000 carcasses. So one time, uh, Brian Bertelson, U.S. Premium Beef, I'm going to, I use this quote like I made it up one time myself, but I stole it from Brian Bertelson. They're talking about marbling and 40% genetics. You know, well, marbling, Brian came up with this. That's a lifetime achievement, that they never had a bad day. And so we can do all these things, and I think the point of Michael Phelps, and I used to have that with him smoking a doobie and stuff in one of my slides, but I took that out for tonight. But, you know, I, don't, I could never swim as fast as Michael Phelps. Or, you know, you've got to have the genetics. I mean, I get these calls every day. They're amazing, and I love it, and I learn something every time. So if I just feed them a little longer, I'll have more prime. Well, not exactly. I mean, you know, well, how do you get more prime? Well, I cheat. I put the right semen in the body of the uterus, and then we go from there. So, okay, so let's go forward. The Japanese were here on a tour with U.S. Premium Beef, and they were doing these translators and this and that, and, and Henry Gardner, they, they were this and they were that, and they were saying, he said, you know, if you have an observation regarding the quality of our product, you're talking to the guy that can change that. And I'm talking to all the people that can change that here, right here, right now. And uh, you Angus breeders in here, you colleagues, and my friends, you know, let's make them better. So there's nothing more exciting than the U.S. premium beef grid. Isn't that right, Brian? And I know we have some folks from Cargill and Tyson and other places here, but this is opportunity. 
And so I mean, we'll, we'll get boring here a little bit. We'll, you know the history a lot of it. So long story short, we went in there 25 years ago, and they sent Mark Gardner, the kid, in there. You know why they sent me, Teresa? Because I had gathered carcass data. I didn't do anything but cl- carry the clipboard. So I often tell everybody, there's John Miller. He's the, he's the evil frickin' packer. You know, and I've been taught my whole life, you cannot trust them. And I'm going, I'm supposed to negotiate the grid with a couple other guys for U.S. premium beef. And John Miller is, he's still a very charismatic man. He's just, they said, well, we're partners. What do we need to do? I said, Mr. Miller, what makes you money? This is in 1997, fall of 1997. He said, that's easy. I, you know, it's the prime. It's the certified Angus beef. It's the high quality products. And so we talk and we go and we do all these different things. And I kind of get my air back and kind of like, you know, talking about your family and friends. I got my air back now. I'm okay. So I said, Mr. Miller, if, he said, if you get too much of this, kind of to your point, if you get too much of this, it's all going to be commodity and it all sells for the same price. And I'm like, you got to quit being a meathead and we got to build demand. And that's what all you did because we put in that grid that day and it's different today, but we, this is the scoreboard right here. We're going to go through that. On January 25th, when these were harvested, Shaw Ranch feedlot, neighbors, friends, partners, you know, they're four miles from here. They fed these cattle, they sorted these cattle up on these 123 head. That pay weight, 4% shrink, 1497, 64.5% yield, 965. We're getting down the weeds. Choice select spread was nine and a quarter. Prime at that time was 3709. Today on US premium beef grid this week is 1988. Four week rolling average. We put that in there. We put the spot in there at that time, and then later we went to the four-week rolling average, quicker target. Then you go to certified Angus beef that day. We put in uh, $3.50 off the top of my head. That's on the four-week rolling average now, too. And so on that day, it was $5.96. Uh, black cadmium premium and certified Hereford beef on down the line, if you look at those. So let's go through and let's look at that and see about how we capture the value. Look at this right-hand side. And the market's different today. I just took this from when it was on January 25th when they harvested. If you look at this, these were 27% prime on these 13-month-old steers. And these 13-month-old steers, because of that prime at 3709, was worth another $11,736. You come on down here and you see $19,881 of actual uh, additional benefit because of the way those cattle graded and yield and all the value like they took down on the individual, this is for the 123 steers that went through there. So let's go through and let's look at that grid and let's look about how we went about that day. And and when you think about, okay, the choice select spread and you think about, I mean, right now the choice select spread is about $9 this week, okay? But if you take the certified Angus beef and choice minus, hey, Angus breeders in here, I like giving you a hard time because you're my friends. Choice minus is not good enough. Oh, my cattle were all choice. There's no money in choice minus. Okay, the certified Angus beef choice minus spread is $17 today, $17. And then you add 1988 on the U.S. premium beef, the four-week rolling average prime. You add all that up, we're talking about over $40 difference. 17 and 20 is 37 and another nine makes $46 difference between that commodity and that value added. So we go through there, we look at that choice select spread at that time was 925, which is pretty similar. Um, then you come through and you look at all these things, added value, that's 975, 100 weight, we're gonna go fast. Certified Angus beef, that was 596, call it six bucks. Let's take it through there, that's $15.21 per 100 weight or 15 cents a pound. Let's take it, oh my, if I can do it with one, I can do it with all of them. Let's prime, look at this. 46 cents a pound. Would you do something more for 46 more cents a pound? So let's take this through and let's see how this added value goes about. And uh, we're going to take this through this individual steer. So we're going to call him 836, which is the breakthrough steer. Uh, This is the prime yield grade two steer. And we're going to look at, uh, you have to always look at the opportunity cost, okay? We could have sold those cattle. They went on feed in late September at Shaw Feed Yard. you know, the opportunity cost, they went in at 1,006 pounds, $1.40 uh, a pound. So I, if we sold them that day, they were worth $1,408. Okay, they were fed, those cattle were fed for about 140 some days. That cost of gain was $1.21, which that cost us 605 So 
break even on these cattle is $2,013 before we do anything. And so when we think about that and we look at that break even and we look about running them through the grid, and I'm not going to get in the weeds on this, but if we were going to, the base price that week was $1.3667. So our live price, if we chose to sell them on a live basis, was $2,039. So with the market appreciation, we would have made $25.72 if we had chose to sell that on the base market uh, for the cash price. So I just made the carcass weights the exact same to make the math more comparable. I didn't want to flip it around because I'm not very good on PowerPoint. And trust me, I have people that help me because I'm not good at it at all. But that being said, uh, U.S. premium beef has got the Western Kansas weighted average plus 25 cents. So you got plus or minus premiums. So the base price, slightly different, because that 25 cents was 2044 Okay, The choice premium was $89. Absence of discounts can often be your biggest premium. Okay, Now this was a yield grade four, remember? So that's a $10, 100 weight discount. So that cost $96. So going through the grid, um, that actually uh, came up to 2361 premium on the choice minus yield grade four carcass. Okay, so we made $23.61 profit on that head versus selling them at the time we could have sold them in late September, but we made $23.61. And you think back um, most of my life, much of my life, oftentimes you think about, you know, it's probably longer ago than I care to admit, but, you know, Dad used to say, you know, every feedlot steer in there, they're trying to make 25 bucks. And that, if they did, that was pretty good. So with the volatility and all the other things that we've discussed and seen in our lives, uh, uh, we can do better. So remember, the same base price, the same thing, at $25.72. If we took $8.36, the breakthrough steer, and we took him through there, we would have got the same $25.72. And that's the key. You've got to know what your genetics are. You've got to know what your cattle are. I mean, I'm getting ready to show you something. Would you rather have $25.72? Or let's send them through the U.S. premium beef grid. All those things are the same. 2044 base price, choice premium 89. Oh my God, carcass premium of prime of 357.18. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Roy Wallace talked about one time, he's talking about this guy that was selling hammers, and he said, you know, I only lost 38 cents a hammer. And Roy told him, and he said, you know, all I really need, Roy, is to have more volume. And Roy goes, he's sitting there nodding, he goes, yeah, so you can go broke faster. You have to know what makes money, you have to know how this is applied, and you have to know that this stuff works. It's amazing. The number three heritable trait, 0.48, Dr. Sally, Dr. Sally, that's good stuff, 0.48 heritable, you know. This stuff works, it's highly heritable, but the ones that don't have those genetics, they're like me, I can't ever beat Michael Phelps, never, ever, ever. You got that? I can't beat, you can't beat him either because you don't have the genetics for that. You know, would you rather make $25 or $472? That's really how we pay the bills in this industry, in this family, in this, in this room. You too can do this. There's so many of you in there and I'm getting ready to show you a bunch of their data. This is our cattle. And one time I gave this talk on just, oh, that's one pin of cattle. Anybody could do that gardener on one pin of cattle. I'm going like, well, okay. So I started charting from that day forward, which was May of 2017. Uh, anybody could do it if they chose to do it, is the way I like to look at it. This is on nearly 14,000 head of cattle. The live weight on those cattle, that's a 4% shrink, is 1433, just shy of 99% choice. On this 14,000 head of cattle, nearly 31% prime. Uh, national average right now is kind of 8, 9, or 10%. A lot of these cattle are home raised, but you see lots of GAR customers. We're, we're fortunate to get to access a lot of those cattle. Go on across there. If you look at that five year average for the, the week's market base price, it's a buck 18. And on the US premium beef grid, we've been able to average $1.27 or 127, 100 weight on there, or $8.74 per 100 weight above the base price. Real cattle. Real customers, $127. And somebody asked me today, what's, the, what's it been in the last year? We're at $191 for all the cattle we fed from a year ago right now until today. So we say all that. We say thank you for being here. 
Uh, we've followed this through since the very first of U.S. premium beef, 122,000 head of cattle have gone through there. This has been real money back in our customers' pocket, back in our industry's pocket, and it's $93, $94 a head for each and every one of those 90, or 122,000 head of cattle. We are thrilled you're here. We're thrilled that you're wanting to look at making your cattle better. We are really proud to be able to help you do that. Thank you so very much.